Let's actually go through and do a bunch of crypto. Like I said, the idea of cryptography is just an invertible function where I take a plain text world, put it into a ciphered world, and so this will be F. This is P, which is plain text. This will be C, which is cipher text. And then obviously going backwards is F inverse. F is denoted as the encryption function, and F inverse is the decryption function. So we're going to go through a lot of different types here. Um, we'll start off here with private key. What are some private key types that we all should know? Again, the idea of a private key is if the function is known, it's trivial to find the inverse function, so you better keep it private and not let anybody know. Uh, the first block we're going to talk about is kind of the classic one that most people are used to, which is what's called a character cipher. The idea of a character cipher is that on the left-hand side, what we're doing is we would take plain text, is really just simply you have P1, P2, P3, P4, up to Pn, and each of these are characters. Character ciphers tend to be used for phonic languages. So if we have English, we have 26. On the other hand, we wouldn't use 26. We would normally use ANSI and have like multiple. 26 is just like A through A through Z, right? But if I said, well, what about Let's use uppercase. So I don't have 26. I actually have, what, 52. But I say, well, I also, the space character is literally the space character. So I actually have 53. But I want period, OK? 54. I want comma, OK? All right. So when we go through this, for here on out, when I use letters like N, um, normally for the plain text, and I talk about the characters, uh, that's the total number of symbols used. So N is going to be the cardinality of characters of the language. So if we only are interested in the typable language as lowercase, it would be 26. If we would do something a lot more useful, which is use the space character, pay, pay attention to things like uppercase, lowercase, pay attention to things like period, comma, all right, that number essentially goes up. And it's more interesting when you actually use characters that are like the non-typical red ones, right? You know, it's like only, it's easy to break things by cryptanalysis if you use too few of characters. Go up into lots of characters, right? Um, so plain text would be that. And then normally the cipher text is usually the same characters. What we've done is we just simply, our function f is just a bijection from characters to characters. So classically, that's what a character cipher is. We just do this one to one and onto function between my characters. And you can see how if we only have 26 characters, how that could probably be trivial. So the first one we're going to talk about is the classic, which is the shift cipher. A shift cipher says the function of plain text, all we're going to do is take one particular character, add a constant to it, and then take mod n. The book is constantly doing mod 26, right? It's not mod, it's not 26. N is how many symbols do you use? So uh, one way to visualize what a shift cipher is, it just simply says add it and modulus makes it into a loop. So a visual of this would be if your characters are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, right? If that's your entire language, 
right? Then say f of p is equal to p plus 2 mod what? How many symbols do I see? 7. So it would be simply mod 7. And so therefore, what would dad become? What would D go to? If it's a plus 2 shift, it would become what? F. What would A become? C. And so it's just FCF. All right, why would this definitely be a private key crypto? Well, if I told you I used a shift cipher plus 2, what would be the inverse function? How would I decrypt this? I would just simply subtract 2. And so this is trivial. So F inverse of a cipher would be just simply take the cipher minus 2 mod 7. So all you get to do is you get to pick the K. What do you want to shift? The shift cipher, because it's modulus, just takes your symbols, writes them in a loop. And that's the easiest way to do it, right? Because if you're at the end, for example, where would G go? What's a G plus 2? It'd become B, right? On these symbols. Just on these symbols, right? And this is one thing I'll do on the test, right? I'll, I'll pick a few symbols so that when you do it, you don't have to sit there and say things like, I want to do a shift 14. Where does M go? Oh, crap, my degree. Right? You'll know how to do it if I just give you seven symbols. And if I just use seven symbols, I can have things like dad and cab, right? You can go and I can give you basic words to encode and decode without doing a whole lot of mental headache. But on the other hand, is this trivial? If I gave you the function, hey, do a plus two cipher, right? You'd say that's pretty easy to decode. So can you see why this would be private? All right. The classic Caesar shift is because Julius Caesar used it as plus three. Why is rot 13 on 26 symbols so important? Right, because we have 26 symbols. If I say do things like add 13, well, wait a second. Under mod 26, plus 13 is congruent to minus 13. Those are the same number, right? So then we just have to simply say do a plus 13 plus 13. Well, I thought I was supposed to do a minus 13. You did, right? For example, if I only wanted to do plus, plus 2 is the same as negative 2, but what is negative 2 mod 7? What is negative 2 the same as when I divide by 7, right? What congruent is they're 7 apart. What's 5, right? So instead of doing a minus 2, I could have actually done a plus 5, and that would decode it, wouldn't it? Where would f go? 1, f would go 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, back to d, right? Modulus loops. <laughs> Not only is it plus 5, it's also plus... What's 5 plus 7? 12, so we can go that way. It would also be minus 9, right? Negative 7 goes around once, and then another negative 2 takes us back to D. Those are all congruent, right? That's why we have that feature as we go through it. So uh, encrypting, decrypting, those are rather easy to do. They're also kind of introduces a new word here, cryptanalysis. Note. Cryptanalysis, cryptanalysis is the idea of, by study of the ciphertext, not truly knowing the encryption function. Like, I don't, I don't literally know what the encryption function is. I may have an idea. I can try some stuff. I don't, I have not been told it. All the only thing I have is a cipher text. You would, the idea is, can you find the plain text? So cryptanalysis is just the idea of look at this encrypted string, try to think what it says, but just by looking at it. Well, if I wasn't told, for example, that it was plus two, but if I guessed that it was a shift, how many shifts would you have to do at worst until you figured out which shift it was? Well, how many shifts are there if I only have seven symbols? 
there's seven of them, a shift of zero, which would be pointless. So I really only would look for what? Six. So I just do six, just look for six shifts, whichever one becomes a word probably would be it, right? And so that's the idea of cryptanalysis. If it's weak to cryptanalysis, you look at it and say, oh, oh that's, that's a plus two. The answer is minus two. Nothing to worry about. So the nice thing about, actually, sorry, the bad thing about shifts, our cryptanalysis is trivial. You just look at it, oh, I'm just going to shift this thing. It's like rotating a dial. And then all, everything shifts, and it's like, oh, I only have to look at six of these things, and I found it. So you can brute force it without thought. And so you would call a shift key weak. Well, let's make it a little bit harder. Uh, the second one would be an affine shift. An affine shift would be my function of the plain text. I'm still going to do a plus K, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the P by a number, then I'm going to add K, and then I'm going to do a mod N again. So what I definitely have to do is turn my symbols into numbers, right? And then I'm going to multiply it by a number, and then I'm going to add the shift, and then I'm going to take a mod N. How would I undo that? If I said you took a number, you multiplied it by 5, and then you added 4. And I would ask, you weren't supposed to do that. Go backwards. How would you go backwards? If you first multiplied by 5 and then added 4, what would you do? Why did you subtract 4? What, is it, what are you literally doing? What's the strong mathematical definition of adding a negative 4? You are creating the, you're using the additive inverse to create the additive identity. Right? That's why you subtracted 4. What's the next thing you would do? You would, you, we said divide by 5, right? But what did you literally do? You're actually using the inverse of a multiplication by 5. But we're under modular arithmetic. Is there such a thing as divide by 5? And when you said divide, you meant 1 fifth, right? That doesn't exist. So you still have to say, I need the inverse of 5. What is the inverse of 5? The thing multiplied by 5 that spits out 1. So the inverse of this of a plain text is the first thing you would, of a cipher, the first thing you would do is go ahead and take away the K because that is the additive inverse, but then I have to multiply by the inverse of A. And then we just go ahead and take the mod. But the thing is, this bar is A's inverse mod N. That immediately gives us a restriction. Does everything have a multiplicative inverse? No. What are the only things that have multiplicative inverses? Those things that are A and N better be what? Relatively prime. And so because of this, this actually says, so the GCD of A and N must be one. It's, this is required. <coughs> In other words, that automatically says affine shifts have a limitation. I cannot pick any number I want. I have to pick numbers that are relatively prime to the number of symbols that I have. Is everybody okay with that? So let's go back to our example. So my characters were A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, G, right? There's my seven. There's seven of them. And then I'm going to make my function that plain text is equal to, all right, since this is equal to seven, the number of characters is equal to seven. I need to pick a number that is relatively prime to seven. Give me a number that's relatively prime to 7. 5. 5. Really, anything but a multiple of 7, right? Since that's a prime. So I'm going to go ahead and pick 5. I'm just going to select 5 because I know that's relatively prime. So I'm going to take 5 times the plain text, and I'm going to add 3, and then I take mod 7. And what I'm going to do is each of these have to be numbers. So let's just start counting at 0. That's 0, 1. 
going to call that 2, I'm going to call that 3, I'm going to call that 4, I'm going to call that 5, I'm going to call that 6. Let's just start counting at 0. We'll act like we're C programmers rather than Fortran programmers. In Fortran, everybody counts at 1. In C, everybody counts at 0, which gives you all sorts of headache. So anyways, um, what would D encode to? That would be F of what? What is D? 3. That is going to be 5 times 3 plus 3 mod 7. What's 5 times 3? 15. What's 15 plus 3? 18. What's 18 mod 7? 4. And so that tells us that D has gone to E. Where would A go? That's F of what? 0, which is 5 times 0 plus 3, mod 7, which is just 3. What is 3? D. And so given that, dad would encode to what? E, D, E. Now here comes the fun part. What's my inverse function? F inverse of cipher, so there's my example right there, and F inverse of the cipher is what? I would take my cipher, I would <coughs> subtract 3 and multiply this by 5's inverse of mod 7. My problem is I don't know what 5's inverse is yet. Could I find 5's inverse? What do we use to do that? Anybody remember from last class? We use who, whose algorithm? Euclid's. So we're going to use Euclid's algorithm. So we have to find 5's inverse under mod 7. So what do we do? What is the GCD? So I'm going to find, we're going to say, okay, all right. What is the GCD of 7 and 5? Well, that is, how do we do it? We say this is 7 is actually how many 5s? One. 1, 5 plus 2. That means I'm not looking for the GCD of 7, 5. I'm actually looking for the GCD of what? 5 and 2. And 5 is how many 2s? 2 plus what left over? 1. And obviously, I'm done, right? I know that this is the, I would get the next one. I'll well write it. The GCD of 2 and 1 is rather easy. This is 2, 2 1s plus 0. Therefore, that was the GCD. That's what we always do when we go through the process. We go to the remainder 0. Okay, so now we take this thing and throw it in reverse. What is 1? I, I take this thing first. What's 1? It is going to be 5 and negative 2 2s. But then I go to the 1 above. What's a 2? The 2 is a 7 with a negative 1, 5, right? We just go up and we keep taking the remainders, right? And throw, We get rid of remainders and throw it to the other side. And so what do I have? I have 1 is equal to, how many 5s do you see? I see a 5 here, and I see how many 5s there? 2. So how many total 5s? 3. So I have 3 5s, and then how many 7s? Negative 2 7s. So the number in front of the 5 is 5's inverse. So 3 is 5's inverse under mod 7. What's the number in front of the 7? Even though we're not going to use it. What is that? Negative 2 is 7's inverse mod 5. I don't need it because I was looking for, well, what if I didn't, here's a good question. What if I didn't like the negative 2? Since I'm under mod 5, I could rather pick what? 3. Because that's the same number. Are we okay with that? 
if you get a negative, you always can get a positive, just add the modulus, and that's the same because you've added zero. So this is what we have, three. That's what I want. So that means this guy here, okay, in our example, the inverse, if I want to invert something, I would take C, take away 3, multiply by 3, and then take mod 7. Because 3 is 5's inverse, which isn't a big surprise. What's 3 times 5? 15. What's 15 mod 7? 1. I probably could have just simply guessed that rather than doing the hard, but obviously you have to do the algorithms when we start to get really big numbers. How would I use this? I would take the number, I'd take the letter, replace it with its number, plug it in there, take away 3, multiply by 3, take mod 7, that's a number, that's the plain text. So we can go both ways. Yep? I still don't understand how you're doing the uh, 1 equals and then all that stuff right there after the UCD. This, all of this, or the second down here? Yeah, this uh, part down there. Okay, what you do is we want to solve for the GCD. So I have this row, and I'll call this uh, P1, I'm going to call this P2. So what we're going to do is we're going to unravel Euclid's algorithm. So I start off with here, this is 1, that's my GCD. So there's my 1 right there. So by P1, which is right there, all I have to do is take this and move it to the other side. What's 1 equal to? It's equal to 5 and then a negative two twos. And then I go up to P2. By P2, then we move up. Well, this here is the remainder. We're constantly figuring that out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and move it to the other side. That is that right there, right? Two, which is this guy, right there, is going to be 7 minus, and I keep taking the remainder to move things over. And so what I'm doing is I'm throwing Euclid's algorithm into reverse. We just simply take what was above, move it to the other side, replace it. And what you definitely do not do is multiply this entire thing out. Right? We don't go through this and multiply it out and say things like, oh, that's 15 and that's negative 14. Yeah, I know that's 1. But we want how many fives, how many sevens, how many twos, how many. So you don't multiply it. You, you keep track of the numbers, how many of this number, and then we just go back up through it. Does that make sense? I didn't realize that the screen up there, for me, that I've got another four lines on my screen that's not showing up on your screen. So if I write below that, and have I been doing that? Okay. Because no. <laughs> I'm like, I'll be happy. Hey, my name is Mark, and I'm writing all this stuff, and you guys don't see anything. All right. So is everybody on this part at least finding inverses? Eventually, finding multiplicative inverses is important because we use it in several areas. But are you okay with the shift and the affine shift and how you would do it? In the end, both of these are a special case of what we could call just simply a random one-to-one -one replacement. Yes? Can you scroll up just a little bit? I didn't finish copying the last right there. Sorry. Right there? Yeah. So both of these are just a straightforward application where it's essentially they're non-random. A goes to here, B goes to here. It's a straightforward non-random selection. A random one-to-one -one replacement would be this idea that if I have, and you would do this by symbolic part, you would just simply say, okay, I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I'm just going to do this. It's the classic arrow diagram functions that, and these are all bijective, and so it's going to go both ways. Now, the shift, A, if I did a shift to, I know A is C, B is D, C is E, right? It's just go two down. Uh, affine shift is a multiplicative move, but you can imagine this as kind of like a tumbler dial. You turn and it went faster than it shifted, but it's still algorithmic. 
there's a there's a conf kind of somewhat confusing algorithm. It's hard. Hopefully, you, a person can't see it. What's a random one-to-one -one replacement? Literally, uh, I'm going to make that B. What's going to be B? Uh, G. What's going to be C? C because I'm tricky. What's D? It's going to be E. Um, what's E going to go to? Let's say A. So I have A, B, C. I don't have D. So A, B, C, D, E, F. There we go. I, just, I don't care. Just randomize it. Right? Just randomly select. And if I do that, what would dad become? Now back to cryptanalysis. Can you see why these are weak? Even if it's random, which is stronger than shift or affine shift, because those have an underlying purpose that you can start to see. In the end, cryptanalysis wouldn't even care, because if it was random and you looked at a string of numbers, you could just use statistics. Let's say I encoded like a paragraph. I go, well, I they wrote in English. The letters that are vowels most likely occur most often. And you just count who occurs most often. I bet that is this. And then you change them all. And you start looking at sizes. <clears throat> oh, that, that word is only, well, actually better yet, if a person encodes space instead of having six, if I have the space character, who occurs most? Space character. So you'll automate, you just look at it usually and you can eyeball that's the space character. So you just replace all of those with the space character and then once you have the space character replaced, what do you have? Word size. And then you, what would you attack? Big words or small words? Small. small words. There's only a few small words that exist in English and if I saw things like EBE and you knew it was a word, same letter, same, all right, now it's really, I bet that thing in the middle is a vowel. Which vowels occur most often? And all of a sudden, you just tear this entire thing apart. I don't even need to know the technique. If you do a one-to-one -one replacement, cryptanalysis will absolutely destroy it. And there's certain people that are, have you seen the movie Rain Man? You know, like, you know, there's people that have certain abilities, like in math and numbers, that they just simply see patterns. Well, and if you throw that in front of them, done. Why? They probably couldn't tell you. All right? And this is simply, this is the way it is. But these are horribly weak, so they're very easy to break. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this shift in, a, in one particular way. And I'm going to talk about a one-time pattern. So what I have is plain text is simply P1, P2, P3, up to Pn. And then what I'm going to do is on top of this, I'm going to put random numbers. I'm going to call this R1, R2, R3, up to Rn. It's just a bunch of random numbers. And then what I'm going to do is to form the cipher. CI is simply a shift. It is PI plus RI mod N. And you're like, well, wait a second. I thought shifts were, were you know, essentially very easy to break. Well, what happens if every single character gets his own shift? Right? And if I look at this, well, it's not exactly a lot longer. What happens here is if I take random noise, just absolute random noise in this room at a certain volume, and then I speak at the same volume, what are you going to hear? Noise. Because noise plus a clean stream is what? Noise. And so what happens is these CIs, the C1, C2, C3, up to CN, is random. Right? If I take a random number and add, really think about it this way. What's a random number plus a known number? Random. Right? It's like what's infinity plus five? Infinity. Infinity wins. Random wins, right? Uh, an easy example is this. It's absolutely possible for me to write, my name is Mark, and then I have random string, and what it got encoded to was A, 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 
and then I hand you your sheet of paper. Please decrypt this. And you look at it. It's just A's. Yeah, please decrypt that. Or worse, it's all blank characters. And I hand you a blank piece of paper. Please break that. <laughs> it's a blank piece of paper. What am I supposed to do? Right? What's the only way to decrypt this? The only way to decrypt it is to simply say, okay, what would be F inverse of the CI? Well, the F inverse of the CI are going to be take each of the CI, subtract the RI, and take mod N. Just, but I have to know the random stream. Right? I subtract the noise. We do this all the time. What if I sat in this room and I knew exactly what the algorithm was for the noise in this room? And then I spoke over it. You would hear nothing. Record it. But, and you generated the noise. What would happen if you exactly subtracted that noise? What would come out? Exactly what you wanted. Right? You would hear it. So you can encode things inside noise. You just got to have exactly the values of the noise. Why is this called a one-time pad? Use it once. Because if you don't use it once, the person then it's then encrypt analysis over time can break it. Well, how can crypt analysis over time break it? That means if I handed a blank sheet of paper, I can't break this. A building blows up. I now have information. It said something about that. And let's say they use it again. Now I have another sheet of paper. It's not blank. It has some characters on it. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's an assassination over here. If they reuse that pad, now I have information that I can start to break. But if you use it once, it is absolutely unbreakable. There is nothing you can do because it's noise. It's amazing how something as simple as, based on a shift, what we're doing is we're taking randomness to it. Use it once, you cannot break it. Classic one-time pads are like books. Right? What should I use for my shift? Well, if I, if you get it, if I send it to you on this day, I meant like it's 10, what is it, 1026, and so I go to page 1026 or page 126 of the Bible or of this famous book, and then you open to it, and then you start, okay, each of the letters that I have in my book are what I'm going to use for my shift. And you just start using that as your shift. Again, even though one time pad is absolutely unbreakable, all the others are breakable easily by cryptanalysis, right? In the end, they're all private. If somebody steals your one time pad, you're toast, right? They're just going to break it. I mean, it's rather easy. They're just going to subtract those random numbers and they get the message back. So let's go into public key. 